I am neither a medical practitioner nor a scientist. I am merely sharing the findings of researchers and forming my own perspectives based on that information. I encourage you to go through the studies and research yourself before coming to any concrete conclusions on this topic. Let's begin. The sensual feeling, the desire to procreate, is the essence of life. We all feel it. This feeling is why birds sing beautifully, why peacocks develop colourful tail feathers, why humans create genial works of art. It is wrapped up in the desire for procreation. This feeling inside of us is the underlying energy of all existence. It regenerates, reinvigorates, and when called into action, sparks new life. It is the all-powerful source, and it is this feeling that created you. The use of this procreative power is at your own discretion. You may use it for procreation. You may use it for the regeneration, maintenance and vitalization of your organism. Or you may release it into the ether for the purposes of sense pleasure. An excess in one area will come at the expense of another area. This is a concept in biology known as the disposable summer theory of aging. As long as one is aware that each choice in excess may come at the cost of the other, then one is free to make their own choices of how best to utilize their energies. Quality of health is quality of life. The vital energy of the human body is not infinite. Plants, animals and humans have a preordained course of growth, decay and an inevitable death. What best determines the maximum length of life preceding death is perhaps the way in which our vital energies are allocated to our physiological functioning. Paraphrasing the writings of Guthrie, the extension of life has less to do with multiplying or increasing our energies and is more about making the best use of our available energies via the preservation and exploitation of said energies. The avoidance of waste and the sealing of leaks. One must then ask, what leaks exist that could be possibly affecting our overall length of life? It is well known that neutered dogs live longer than non-neutered dogs. Many studies indicate that insects and animals that don't engage in reproductive activities outlive insects and animals that do engage in these activities. At least two known studies have indicated that eunuchs live longer than non-eunuchs. Of course, becoming a eunuch is not a desirable course for any human being, as it carries its own consequences of damage to the organism. The most prevalent hypothesis concerning the relationship between reproduction and longevity predicts that reproduction is costly, particularly in females. What is it about the reproductive activity that seems to shorten lifespan? It appears that perhaps it is not the state of desire, the feelings of lust, that are to blame here. On the contrary, people with high sexual interest have been studied and reported to live longer than those with low sexual interest. Likewise, many of the Taoists didn't believe in restraining oneself from the physical act. In fact, they developed many sexual techniques to boost this energy. They did, however, believe in conserving the sexual fluids and refraining oneself from releasing their fluids via the act of coition. The sexual feeling has been long known as a source of vitality for both men and women. From the famous words of Napoleon Hill, sex desire is the most powerful of human desires. When driven by this desire, men develop keenness of imagination, courage, willpower, persistence, and creative ability unknown to them at other times. So strong and impelling is the desire for sexual contact that men freely run the risk of life and reputation to indulge it. When harnessed and redirected along other lines, this motivating force maintains all of its attributes of keenness, of imagination, courage, etc which may be used as powerful creative forces in literature, art, or in any other profession or calling, including, of course, the accumulation of riches. 
the transmutation of sex energy calls for the exercise of willpower, to be sure, but the reward is worth the effort. The desire for sexual expression is inborn and natural. The desire cannot and should not be submerged or eliminated, but it should be given an outlet through forms of expression which enrich the body, mind and spirit of man. If not given this form of outlet through transmutation, it will seek outlets through purely physical channels. A river may be dammed and its water controlled for a time, but eventually it will force an outlet. The same is true of the emotion of sex. It may be submerged and controlled for a time, but its very nature causes it to be ever seeking means of expression. If it is not transmuted into some creative effort, it will find a less worthy outlet. Fortunate indeed is the person who has discovered how to give sex emotion an outlet through some form of creative effort. For he has, by that discovery, lifted himself to the status of a genius. Scientific research has disclosed these significant facts. The men of greatest achievement are men with highly developed sex natures, men who have learned the art of sex transmutation. The men who have accumulated great fortunes and achieved outstanding recognition in literature, art, industry, architecture and the professions were motivated by the influence of a woman. The research from which these astounding discoveries were made went back through the pages of biography and history for more than 2,000 years. Wherever there was evidence available in connection with the lives of men and women of great achievement, it indicated most convincingly that they possessed highly developed sex natures. The emotion of sex is an irresistible force against which there can be no such opposition as an immovable body. When driven by this emotion, men become gifted with a superpower for action. Understand this truth and you will catch the significance of the statement that sex transmutation will lift one to the status of a genius. The emotion of sex contains the secrets of creative ability. Destroy the sex glands, whether in man or beast, and you have removed the major source of action. For proof of this, observe what happens to any animal after it has been castrated. A bull becomes as docile as a cow after it has been altered sexually. Sex alteration takes out of the male, whether man or beast, or the fight that was in him. Sex alteration of the female has the same effect. Reproduction requires energy. Maintenance of the organism and cellular repair systems also require energy. It is said that a biological trade-off is taking place here. That reproductive costs come at the expense of physiological maintenance and functioning and ultimately influence the organism's potential lifespan. The release of hormones will influence where these resources of the body are being allocated, whether towards reproductive or towards other systems of maintenance. More energy allocated to one resource, reducing the availability to the other. It seems that in order to make a new life, we must sacrifice a small portion of our own life. The human body's ability to utilize energy is finite. A human body can optimally live up to 100 years and in some cases longer. It takes about this much time for the energy requirements of the body to exceed the dwindling supply of energy our body has available to utilize. Provided that the body doesn't succumb to injury illness or anything else that prematurely ends somatic life. Again, the energy running our body and keeping us alive is limited, and the speed at which we use up this energy will determine the length of time we can maintain optimal functioning of the body and ultimately the length of life we will live. Of course, none of this is to say that we shouldn't reproduce. On the contrary, Reproduction is perhaps the most important biological function that humans are capable of. 
it is the very act of reproduction that ensures the survival and continuation of our species. By all means, reproduce. But it is perhaps wise to be aware of the biological trade-offs associated with reproductive activity and longevity before deciding on how frequently we wish to engage in reproductive activity. Many people see the reproductive faculties as a faculty for pleasure rather than a tool for procreation, a harmless activity that comes without physical consequence, and thus proceed to use those resources excessively and without restraint. Costs of reproduction occur when an increase in reproductive rate reduces future reproduction by increasing mortality or reducing fertility. Such costs have been demonstrated in plants and animals in laboratory and field studies. Most accounts assume that these occur as a result of competition for nutrient allocation between growth, storage, somatic maintenance and reproduction. An increase in reproductive rate would then result in a denial of nutrients to other processes, resulting in a drop in life expectancy or future fertility. Some support for this point of view comes from the finding that lifespan is lengthened in female Drosophila melanogaster fruit flies that have inactive or absent ovaries, or that are experimentally induced to produce fewer eggs. The disposable summer theory of aging states that organisms age due to an evolutionary trade-off between growth, reproduction and DNA repair maintenance. Formulated by Thomas Kirkwood, the disposable summer theory explains that an organism only has a limited amount of resources that it can allocate to its various cellular processes. Therefore, a greater investment in growth and reproduction would result in reduced investment in DNA repair maintenance, leading to increased cellular damage, shortened telomeres, accumulation of mutations, compromised stem cells, and ultimately, senescence. Although the mechanisms responsible for this reduction of lifespan due to reproduction are still not completely understood, it appears logical, at least from my own point of view, that less reproductive activities over the long term will lead to more availability of energy resources, which the body can use for DNA maintenance, blood and organ improvement, enhanced energy distribution across all areas of the body, increased physical performance, mental performance, and thus ultimately longer life. Your physical energy, your mental energy, your reproductive energy. All three activities draw from the same source of energy and an excess of expenditure in one of these areas will perhaps lead to a reduction in the overall longevity of the organism. Be wary of this balance. This knowledge of the biological expense of reproduction on the body has been intuitively known since old times. The benefits of abstaining is a topic spanning over many thousands of years across numerous ancient cultures throughout history. And it is only in recent years been backed by scientific research. The greatest intellectual geniuses in both ancient and modern times led continent lives. In most cases, individuals who have achieved have been forced by necessity to abstain from sexual indulgence, as Cervantes who wrote Don Quixote while in prison, or Dante, who wrote his Divine Comedy while in exile. Milton wrote Paradise Lost when blind and when he did not indulge in sex. So Isaac Newton, active in intellect until the age of 80, led a continent life from birth, and so did Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo, both of whom retained their creative genius until an advanced age. It is a testament to the depths of knowledge that the ancients had penetrated, that thousands of years before any scientific studies existed, the benefits of preservation were instinctively known. It was intuitively understood that the preservation of the procreative energies was conducive to long life, good health, higher intelligence and moral character. This intuitive knowing lies somewhere within us all. Migratory birds carry no radar, yet travel across continents with this inner intelligence. Snakes are not raised by their mothers or fathers, yet become naturally adroit hunters. 
There is a biologically imparted wisdom contained within the seeds of creation, within us all that can source everything that we need to know in order to survive and thrive. The term degenerate refers to one who practices no sexual restraint and is morally perverse. Furthermore, as a verb, the word to degenerate refers to physical and mental deterioration of the organism. This is not just a moral issue, it is a physiological one. The function of reproduction has by its very nature a disintegrative, deteriorating influence upon the organism in which it occurs. Down at the bottom of the scale of life, in the simplest organisms, Reproduction is affected by fission, by the division of the simple being into parts, each of which takes on a separate life and becomes a complete individual. The Gregorina consists of an almost homogeneous jelly enclosed in a sac or a body wall. When the time for reproduction arrives, the body breaks up and divides into a number of spindle-shaped masses which remain enclosed in the sac. Then the sac bursts and each spindle develops into an adult Gregorine. Here, in this simplest and most fundamental instance, the performance of reproduction is attended by the entire destruction and disappearance of the parent. The individual ceases to exist as an individual and exists only in its offspring. In the higher animals and in the human race, in which reproduction is such an immensely longer and more elaborate process, it has still the same essential nature. The parent still persists as an individual, it is true, after the birth of the offspring. The individuality of the parent is not entirely dissipated and lost in the process of reproduction, and still that process is not affected without cost. The whole life of the parent is not lost, it is true, but a part of it is lost. With each reproductive act, the bodily energy is diminished. The capacity for exertion is lessened. The languor and lassitude that follow indicate the strain that has been put upon the forces of the body. The amount of energy that has been abstracted from the store at the disposal of the organism. The evidence of this loss is abundant. Various plants, animals and insects are known to die soon after their first reproductive act. This is known as semal parity. A common example of a semal paris creature is the Pacific salmon that will live for many years in the ocean and upon reproducing will undergo rapid degeneration and die shortly after. If the reproductive act and the subsequent loss of our procreative fluids is harmless, as many have proclaimed, then why is there such ample evidence in nature suggesting otherwise? Written in the 1800s The more the seed and fluids are retained in the body without waste, the greater fullness of life, health and power is experienced by the person. An abundance of this lymph gives a feeling of rest happiness and satisfaction under all circumstances, also physical strength and love of activity. This fluid aids in forming the bright red corpuscles of the blood and also assists the lungs in their work of purification. A portion of this regenerated blood passes into the spleen where the pure white corpuscles are formed. From thence, the most refined elements are taken up through the nerve system into the brain and there changed into the subtle element of thought potency, giving power to mental action. There are three ways of spending the life forces. First, through the physical and muscular energies. Second, through the mental energies. Third, through the sex function. To whatever extent there is expenditure in either of these three channels, there will be so much less force in reserve for the others. Persons have mental energy or lack mental as well as physical power in proportion as they are chaste or licentious in their habits and in delineating character, the most important thing to be noticed is their habit sexually. For if persons are inclined to be indulgent and waste their life forces and elements, 
so will they lack mental and physical power, and in proportion as they conserve these potencies and life fluids will they have mental and physical ability. If the life is concentrated in the sexual function and used up or wasted there, then the activity will be nearly all in that direction and there will be lack of power in other channels in proportion as it is overactive there. That the internal secretion of the sex glands may have a nutritive function in relation to nervous tissue and that mental diseases may result from its absence is indicated by many observations. Obrija Pahun Ureke found degeneration of the seminiferous tubules and absence of spermatogenesis in dementia precox. They believe the spermatozoa may have an internal physiological function and that dementia precox may result from their absence. They attribute the degeneration of the seminiferous tubules to auto-intoxication resulting in disturbed metabolic conditions. McCarrison remarks that atrophy of the testicles is frequently found in cerebral and spinal diseases. The saying that thoughts manifest themselves physically is often disregarded as feel-good New Age nonsense. But there is perhaps very accurate biological evidence to support this claim. The glands. The glands respond to emotional states secreting chemical substances based on the experience of those emotions. Certain strong emotions, particularly those of fright, will cause the secretion of chemical substances which will produce an evacuation of the bowels and artificially induced diarrhea. Pleasant emotional states cause a flow of the digestive juices and promote the appetite, while unpleasant news, grief, worry and similar emotional states will cause one to lose all appetite for food. Again, it has been proved that fear, anger and especially jealousy produce secretions which tend to poison the system, while cheerful, hopeful and inspiring mental states are seen to induce secretions which act as a physical tonic. It is a matter of common experience and of scientific record that sad and depressing emotional states, long continued, tend to bring about a state of ill health, lessened vitality and even ultimate death. These physiological processes now being known to result directly from the presence and action of toxic secretions in the blood. On the other hand, it is as well known that the emotional states of successful love, certainty or strong hope of success in business or social undertakings, etc. will produce a marked improvement in the general health of the individual, in some cases almost working a miracle in his physical condition. The effect of depressing emotions in the direction of inducing disease and retarding cure, and the effect of cheerful inspiring emotions the direction of maintaining or restoring health are too well known to require extended arguments to prove the action of the emotional states upon physiological conditions. Many times emotions may seem merely mental in quality, somewhat abstract in form, and we may not make the connection to the physical, yet the connections are very physical. We carry various hormone secreting glands in our body that have a range of interactions with our emotions and physical body. To name a few well-known instances, lustful desire can stimulate hormone production via the testes, causing many deep biological and behavioral changes. Acute stress can cause the adrenal glands to release cortisol and adrenaline, which carries a cascade of physiological responses affecting blood pressure, heart rate, body temperature, and so on. The regulation of our emotions ties into the regulation of our physical state, and ultimately, our health. The quality of our thoughts play a very significant role in the quality of our body. With this awareness of how our emotional state will affect our organism's health and physiological processes, it is important that we consider our mental approach to life 
and how best to live it, as to avoid prolonged states of anxiety, misery, excessive lust and depression. For these reasons and from personal observation, it is a must that we must develop the spirit of play towards life. To experience life as a game to be played rather than as a burden to be shouldered. Every one of your daily disturbances can be greatly reduced in stress response through altering your response to negative stimuli you come across. Become aware of just how serious you have been taking life. Just how worried you have become about your future and past at the expense of your day-to-day -day enjoyment. Every time you find yourself worrying about your future or past, it is best to stop, breathe deep and laugh at just how seriously you have been taking life. Why are games fun? Because you get to play them. Why are jobs dull? Because you have to do them. This life is either a job to do or a game to play. You can see yourself as simply you or a character that you get to play. You have been given a character profile and a special role. Your character has a long list of traits and specs. Body strength, 60%. Intuition, 75%, charm, 65%, and so on. You can spend time upgrading your traits and skill sets, or you can simply go through the game with what you've got. It's up to you, and both ways of playing are fun. You are assigned a body, a particular character inside of this particular life. You are here to play your character and play this game. It is up to you to maximize your character's strengths and minimize weaknesses. It is not childish to see this as a game. It is highly intelligent, as it can give you the perspective often needed to realize not to react so emotionally to stressful situations, as it is just a game. Often we lose emotional investment in a game because we ultimately know it's not real. Conversely, we tend to take life very seriously for the fact that we think of it as real, as the be-all and end-all. Games every year are becoming more interactive and more immersive, and particularly more real. I think it is fair to assume that as game technology progresses, we will opt to play games without conscious recognition of the outside world for a fully immersive experience. It is not far-fetched to assume that the games of the future will be able to be played without our conscious awareness of it being just a game. This would enhance the experience of a game dramatically if we were to play it thinking it was real. And if the future of gaming will be able to numb our conscious awareness of the game for the sake of the experience, then what's to say it hasn't already happened and that we are currently playing such a game now? You have numerous weak points and a few powerful areas. It is your mission to go through these levels without dying and perhaps collecting enough on the way so that you are better off at each level you reach. Of course, some levels will almost kill you and you'll be worse off starting the next round. Yet this is how the game is to be played. Your experience is always accumulating. It is an adventure. Some of you are playing on hard mode and some on easy mode. Be thankful if you're on hard mode as it provides a bigger challenge and thus overall a more satisfying game to play. Remember the depths of your happiness are matched by the depths of sadness. The people born into easy mode often miss the opportunities to go through tough struggle and thus can only attain a surface level enjoyment of the game. Don't be weak-willed and wish that you had it easier. If you're playing on hard mode, be strong and rise to the challenge. Your experience will also depend on how you wish to play the game. Will you simply spend it building your fortune and retiring at the end in castles with wealth? Or will you go through the seemingly infinite missions available on the Earth map, seeking many adventures, meeting new people, eating new foods, experiencing new places, and so on. 
Some of you will wish to spend your hours, days and years in one place where you hone a particular skill and become an expert at it. This is a respectable pursuit. It really doesn't matter what you choose. The choice is yours. Regardless, at the end, you will all leave through the same door. You can make this game a wild adventure, a tamed experience or nothing at all. You are playing a role and none of it is nearly as serious as you have been conditioned to believe. Focus on the present moment of gameplay with no worry about the future and past obstacles. Those thoughts detract from the fun of the game. View your immediate surroundings now. This is where you are and this is where you shall concentrate your energies. Of course there is a time to formulate your plan and map out strategy. But for the most part, get involved in the game itself. Your movements, your functions, cook a steak, run to a park, experience things. If you don't realize this is a game, you will be bound by its rules and regulations. You must realize this is a game to be played in order to become a free spirit. A free spirit is all powerful in this world. They are free because they know they are not locked into all of these parameters of life. They are simply moving through them freely with an intrinsic awareness that this is a game to be played. They know something that others don't know and that allows them to not be locked down by the illusions that this game offers. Before you can start living this reality as the game that it is, it will be helpful to lose the fear of death. The fear of death is what encourages people to keep taking their life so seriously and paradoxically stops them from really living and enjoying this experience of this game. This is not to say you should be reckless. What happens when a day is over? You go to sleep and awake to the new day. What happens when a game is over? You either play a new one or go on about your real life. What happens when a dream is over? You wake up and continue on with living. What we are in right now is the same. It is a temporary, limited sensory experience that is a smaller world of a much larger world that exists outside of this realm. We cannot grasp this outside world with observation as none of it is observable from our position. Yet we can grasp its existence by following the patterns of this world as the seeds that created this world grew from the elements of the world we came from. It is impossible for Mario to get a glimpse of the human world in which resides the human who created Mario. Yet, although Mario cannot glimpse this human world, he could learn much about our universe by observing the patterns and phenomena from his own Mario universe. Mario has eyes, a mouth, ears and a nose, just as the makers of his universe have. Mario can jump, walk, run and swim, just as the creators of his universe can. In Mario Land, there exists turtles, castles, clouds, trees, humans, animals, and many other things that have been modeled from the features of our own universe. The origins of the Marioverse reveal many of the elements of our own universe, for man created Mario in his own image. Do you see what's going on here? that through the patterns of the created world, we can get a glimpse into the world of the creator. We also have a creator. Look at yourself. You have been designed. You will grow a finger from your hand, just as a duck will grow a beak from its head. A duck will never grow a finger from its head, as you will never grow a beak from your hand. Your hand will not grow in any other way because it is following a pattern of growth, a template, a design. Where did these directives of growth come from? The function and growth of this universe is highly indicative of design. Perhaps from a place that in many ways resembles our own form of existence. 
the creation carries within itself the seeds of the Creator. We don't need much more detail than that for now. We are here to play this game, and that is what we must focus on. When you see this existence as a game, then you can begin to play it, rather than only do it. If you want to boost your character's specs, do it. If your power meter is low, join a gym. If your health meter is low, eat well and exercise. Find areas of interest and accumulate knowledge in them, and over time you can use these to build power, wealth and fortune. If you wish to have experiences, travel around the world and get lost in it. Go to faraway places, get into adventures and do the things you never thought you were capable of doing. Be open to the opportunities that come your way and see where this world takes you. The only rule worth keeping is to not hurt others along the way. Break out of this ridiculous mold of reality that is stretched over your brain. There is so much out there to do, so much that you don't know, so much to experience. You are free to explore it. Get out of familiar territory, go somewhere in nature and just start walking. Get as lost as you can. Get a train to a faraway place. Go on an adventure, even for a day. Set a list of physical objectives. Get yourself into game mode. Anything that is draining your zest for life should be eliminated, unless your plan in this game is to accumulate money at the cost of everything else. We can look at life as a winding road of misfortune inevitably leading down to our physical demise, or we can see it as a game to be played, much like a board game or video game where we get to control our character in any way we see fit and carry out our mission and complete levels for many years. The changing of an approach to life as that of a game will without doubt allow one to alleviate the negative stimuli experienced in life or at the very least, not respond to that negative stimuli with heightened emotion. Look around you. This was all created for you to experience, for your pleasure. Enjoy it. Your feelings about this world shape this world. Our emotional state will play perhaps the most significant role in the shaping of this experience. Finally, the effect of emotional states upon the sexual organism is well known to physicians and recognized to at least some extent by the general public. The sexual organism is aroused into activity and increased secretion by thoughts, mental images and feelings of an amorous character is generally recognized. Indeed, in the case of young persons, physicians and moralists make a point of the importance of the avoidance of books, pictures, plays, and other suggestions which tend to arouse such feelings. There is on all sides the conviction that it is well to keep the mind off such things. The artificial stimulation of the sexual nature by erotic literature, suggestive pictures, amatory plays, etc. is an established fact that such things stimulate the sexual secretions is undoubted. In the second place, modern psychology, especially those of its phases which are concerned with the effect and influence of mind or thought upon general health or disease or upon their special phases of forms, teaches positively that the character of one's thoughts, fixed ideas, beliefs, and above all, of his confident expectation has a positive and decided effect upon the functioning of his physical organism. Warm areas are more conducive to life. It is in the summer that humans thrive and mortality is down. In the winter, mortality goes up. It is in the summer that the bugs enter the house. Summer is the season that is teeming with life. It is in the hotter areas where insects are generally larger, more colorful, more robust. Look at the fruits from the tropics. More colors, more flavor, and more nutrition. Cited from a Brazilian study. 
It is shown that virtually unknown edible tropical fruits present significantly higher antioxidant activity when compared to temperate fruits considered to be good sources of antioxidants. The article went on to cite tropical fruits containing higher levels of phenolic and polyphenolic compounds, flavonoids and absorbic acid in comparison to temperate fruits. Where do older people normally move to after retirement? Warmer climates. There is perhaps already an inherent knowledge within us that the warmer areas are more supportive of good health and thus longer life. The sun is absolutely vital to our existence. It provides much nutrition to our body and helps to regulate our hormones, our blood, organ integrity, mitochondrial function and so forth. The sun is our best natural source of vitamin D. A deficiency in vitamin D has been linked to a whole host of life-shortening illnesses such as obesity, diabetes, cancer, hypertension, depression, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, osteoporosis and neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and so on. Those with low vitamin D levels have an associated risk with all-cause mortality. Vitamin D, a secosteroid hormone, appears to have significantly beneficial effects on various physiological systems, including the musculoskeletal system. Vitamin D assists in the regulation of numerous critical biological functions and physiological processes in humans, including inflammation, oxidative stress and mitochondrial respiration and is also linked to cardiac diseases. It is also reported that vitamin D plays a central role in molecular and cellular mechanisms which reduce oxidative stress and tissue damage and regulate cellular health. On the other side, hypervitaminosis D or vitamin D deficiency reduces mitochondrial activity and increases oxidative stress and inflammation in the body. Hypervitaminosis D increases the prevalence and severity of cellular damage. It has also been reported that vitamin D is involved in many functions of the reproductive system in human and critically play an important role in the reproductive tissues of women and men. It is also worth noting that vitamin D deficiency is considered to be one of the most common medical conditions worldwide. With the industrialization of the world, our time spent indoors has dramatically increased and as a result our exposure to sunlight has significantly decreased. It has been reported that 30 to 50 percent of both children and adults in the United States, Canada, Europe, Australia, New Zealand and Asia are vitamin D deficient. The sun contains UVA radiation which along with having beneficial effects on our cardiovascular system and heart health causes the release of nitric oxide from skin stores. Nitric oxide supports cell regeneration and intracellular communication. As we age we lose our ability to produce nitric oxide resulting in loss of skin health, poor complexions and without it lines and wrinkles begin. Good health is the lawful product of good climate, good environment and good habits. Bad health is the lawful product of bad climates, bad environment and bad habits. All so simple that it exposes and explodes the sweetest racket on earth and shows how foolish it is for supposedly intelligent persons to write a library of technical books to explain a problem that a child can understand. Creation constantly requires the presence of certain climatic and environmental conditions for the operation of its processes. These processes cannot produce a coconut grove in the Arctic zone, a school of fish on dry land, nor a forest in a desert. A matter that simple must be concealed in technical volumes in order to keep the masses from learning the facts. The job has been so well done that authors of the books are as badly confused as the man in the street. Living organisms and plants cannot come into actual being until all conditions are such as to bring them into actual being. The egg contains a potential chick, 
but the chick will never become reality unless the egg is surrounded by certain definite conditions. One of these is an atmospheric temperature constantly close to 103 degrees Fahrenheit for a certain length of time. Slight variations of the heat, either up or down, are fatal to the potential chick in the egg. This law is not nullified by the birth of the chick. After the chick is created and becomes a physical reality, it will still perish if not surrounded by certain conditions. If the variation from these conditions is so slight as not to cause death immediately, or within a few hours or a few days, then death comes on by imperceptible degrees, by a process of degeneration creeping over the creature so gradually and slowly that the fact is not known until the end is near. On average, people who work longer seem to live longer, whereas people who retire earlier seem to suffer health issues earlier and thus die sooner. This is not to say you should work longer. Length of life is perhaps not the most important barometer of a good life and quality of life can be measured by many variables outside of longevity. Such values of what constitutes good living are to be judged individually. However, for those whose goals for living are linked in with long life, then this is perhaps an important area of consideration. A job can help stabilize sleep routine, keep the mind stimulated through socializing with other humans, regulate eating times and give one a sense of purpose. Of course, this is dependent on the individual and the employment they are undertaking. There are various papers from as far back as 50 years prior correlating early retirement to early death. Evidence from the updated 1973 exact match suggests that men retiring early are likely to die sooner than men retiring later. A 2001 working paper links between early retirement and mortality. The author used cross-sectional current population survey matched to longitudinal Social Security Administration data and found that men who retire early die sooner than men who retire at age 65 or older. A famous Japanese doctor, Hinohara, who lived past 100 years old, shared the same advice for living a long life. There is no need to ever retire, but if it is, it must be well past 65. He was said to work 18 hours a day until only a few months before his death at 105 years old. Our brains and bodies have been designed to be engaged with, to be moving, working, problem solving. The more we use our body's functions, the more functionality it maintains. If you don't use it, you lose it. For the majority of workers, employment will create a stable sleep routine that is more reliable than one without any work commitments. Of course, this is not guaranteed and many working irregular shifts and night shifts may not have the luxury of a stable sleep schedule. If you have allocated work hours, it becomes more important to be conscious of your sleep times and adhere to them more strictly than someone who had no work commitments to wake up to. Closer adherence to your circadian rhythm means closer adherence to the rising and setting of the sun. And this is the most healthy timetable of wake and sleep we can follow. When the sun goes down to sleep as soon as possible and when the sun rises to awake as soon as possible. This is following nature and following nature will yield the greatest health benefits. On the subject of food, I wish not to impart specific forms of diet for the reason that I have seen longevity in a range of diets. Some of my favorite writers practiced vegetarian diets and lived well into their 90s, though I know of various meat eaters living 90 and above too. Some of the highest life expectancy countries consume diets rich in meat, such as Japan, South Korea and Hong Kong. Yet their consumption is of a much lesser amount than Western countries in which the life expectancy is significantly shorter. 
I think a few key approaches to optimize eating are as follows. A very simple one. For every piece of food that enters your mouth, ask yourself, was this made in a factory or did it come straight from the earth, from the ground? Put more things that come from the earth in your mouth and less things that come from a factory. I would encourage you to aim for at least 80% earth foods, vegetables, fruits, beans, rice, if inclined, freshly cooked meats. Stay away from that which was processed through machinery and a conveyor belt. Eat that which came directly from the earth, was rinsed and prepared for eating. Moderate amounts. The countries that live longer tend to consume less. In studies, the mice that lived longer consumed less. Eat what you need and then stop. Stop before you are completely full. Stop at 80%. This is easier said than done. If you find this hard, start by eating slowly. And if you find that hard, start by chewing more times. 50 times a mouthful for a meal will slow things down. This will improve nutrient absorption. It will also improve your jaw power and build jaw muscles. This becomes visually apparent after some years of correct practice. Weston Price noted through his research in the 1930s that poor nutrient absorption was responsible for poor dental and facial development in children from developed cities as compared to the well-developed facial and sound dental health of children in primitive tribes. Chew your food well. If there was one overarching piece of advice to follow the way of regeneration and avoid the pitfalls of degeneration, it would be this. Follow nature. Follow the sun and follow the moon. Eat when the sense to eat comes. Avoid external stimuli that overstimulates the senses, whether that be auditory, visual, sexual. Be in nature. Breathe fresh air. Get sunlight. Move your body as it was designed to be moved. The more in line with the aspects of nature your body becomes, the more in line you are with life.